Good evening, friends. It's lovely to see you again. Tonight we have a very exciting topic in our series, Revelation of Hope. It is called Revelation's Most Amazing Prophecy. A number of years ago, Debbie Williams and a few of her friends poised for a moment in the open door of an aeroplane 12,000 feet above Phoenix, Arizona. Seconds later, they were plummeting down to earth, planning to link up halfway for a special formation. She got a little bit left behind and went into a corkscrew twirl to try and catch up with her friends. But not being such an experienced skydiver, she hit into one of her colleagues and she became unconscious. She started going down like a rag doll. Debbie, Debbie was plummeting toward earth. As she went past the instructor, Gregory Roberts, he saw the blood on her face and he realized that she's going to die. He then went into a no-lift dive, tucking his neck in like this, his chin into his chest, his toes pointed, and his arms tight against his sides. He started accelerating to a speed of 290 kilometers per hour trying to catch Debbie. But he just couldn't reach her. But he just kept going. And the earth was coming closer and closer. The next moment, he caught up with her. And he pulled the emergency cord. And with only 10 seconds to go, her life was saved. We are also plummeting toward Earth's final event. There are earthquakes, wars and rumors of wars. Things are happening all around us. The social fiber of society is falling apart. Divorce is rampant and abuse is everywhere. Violence is increasing by the day. Sexual promiscuity is going out of hand. And at the same time, the good news is that the gospel is going to all the world. Nations are being reached by the thousands of people. Nations that were out of reach for many, many decades. Yes, friends, we are approaching ground zero at a terrific speed. And most people don't have a parachute. And some people are just unconscious. They don't even know what is going to happen next. But with only seconds to go, I've got good news. God has planned a mid-air rescue. And this rescue is described in God's last day message, the book of Revelation. God always sends a message to prepare His people for major worldwide events which affect their eternal destiny. God has never surprised His people. He has always sent a message before a major event. A loving God invites men and women to be saved before the coming calamity. God wants to save people. He doesn't want to destroy people. In the time of Noah, God used this man as a preacher for 120 years, a message of hope, a message of rescue, a message of salvation, a message of grace, a message of coming to God and repenting of their sins. But the people just hardened their hearts and they laughed at Noah because they didn't believe that the calamity was coming. And it was only when everybody had made a decision, when everybody had made their choice, that the door of the ark was closed and then the destruction came. In the time 
of Joseph in Egypt, God lovingly sent a warning to this heathen Pharaoh and told him of the calamity that was coming so that the people could prepare. God used Joseph as his mouthpiece. Many of the prophets were used in the Old Testament to warn of coming destruction to Jerusalem. And one of the famous messengers who appears at the beginning of the New Testament is John the Baptist who prepared the way for Christ's earthly ministry. God sent a messenger before Jesus came and lived, died and was resurrected on this earth. The book of Revelation is the message that God is sending to His last day people before a great calamity is going to hit this planet. And it comes in a very, very magnificent and wonderful way. God's end time message comes in the very heart of the book of Revelation. It comes with a voice of three angels. Revelation 14 verse 6 then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Yes, friends, these angels are not floating in the sky. They are flying at high speed to bring this message of hope, of salvation, so that everyone could have a chance. God wants to save people. It's a universal message. It goes to every kindred, nation, tongue, and people. Yes, friends, in the pages of the Word of God, in the pages of the book of Revelation, God's last day message to a dying planet, there's a message of hope. And what event does this message prepare all humanity for? What is this event you can see that there's very little time left in the hourglass we read about this event in revelation 14 verse 14 to 16 i looked and there before me was a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like the son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. What is the meaning of Revelation's symbol of the harvest? In Matthew 13 verse 39 we read, The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So what is the harvest? It's the end of the age. Yes, friends, Christ's coming is depicted as Him reaping the earth. He is reaping the harvest, the harvest of souls. But as you know, when we harvest, the precious grain is separated from the chaff. There's two groups. We can choose tonight where we want to be. In which group do we want to stand in? Yes, friends, when Jesus comes, it will be the end of sin. Revelation 14 verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. Many people think that Revelation is all these ugly monsters. But here the central theme of this message is what? The everlasting gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus who came to set us free from our sins. He wants to deliver you, my friend, tonight from that evil vice in your life, from that habit that you cannot break, from that hatred that you've been carrying so long in your heart. He wants to set you free. Through Jesus, 
we can be set free. That's the good news of the book of Revelation. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 and 4. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He died for our sins. And that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. This is the Gospel. This is the good news that someone, someone gave His life for you and for me. You know what I found interesting? I read a bit more about Debbie Williams and Gregory Roberts. You know, he was an instant hero, you can imagine. This man who risked his life to save this woman from a sure death. And they asked him, would you have gone all the way and given your life for her? He said, no. I would have pulled but there's someone who didn't pull. Someone who went all the way for us. He could have pulled and said, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to go all the way. When they were spitting on him, when they were cursing him, when they were mocking him, when the disciples had fled, yes, those who were the closest to him, even Peter who said he would never leave Jesus, he would even die with Jesus, even Peter had run. Jesus did not pull the emergency cord. He went all the way. The everlasting gospel, number one, it says that Christ died for whose sins? Our sins. Friends, the cross of Christ is everything to us. The cross of Christ is our only hope. If Jesus did not die, we would have been hopeless. Our faith depends on what Christ did for us, not what we do for ourselves. Yes, friends, Jesus' death on the cross bought salvation for you and me. And it comes as a free gift. All we have to do is accept it. That's all. John 3.16, probably the most well-known words in the Bible. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the aching in God's heart. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. He wants all of us to be saved. You know, if you think of a parent who has a number of children, maybe you are a parent with a number of children, and there's a family get-together, I think especially the mothers, are only satisfied when all the children are there, isn't it? They must all be there. If there's one not there, there's an emptiness. God wants all His children with Him. Number two, Christ lived a perfect life. Christ's perfect life record is put in place of the sinful records of all who accept Him. That's called justification. Isn't that good news? So if you can see your name with your sinful record, and yes, Christ's name with His perfect record, when you accept Him, if you think of a computer, those of you who are computer literate, you control A, and then you delete. In fact, you don't even delete it. You copy it. And then you bring it over here. This one you put here. So His perfect life is attributed to us. 
and our sins are on Him. Isn't that amazing? It's so incredible. You know, that's the best news that we can hear. That when God the Father looks at me, if I've accepted Jesus, He sees His Son's perfect life. That's good news. Number three, Christ rose from the dead. And he's alive today. His tomb is empty. And you can talk to him about anything. Yes, that burden that you've been carrying this last month, those questions that you have, those uncertainties, those fears, those anxieties, the pain in your heart, you can talk to him as a friend. I heard the story of a man who was dying in hospital. And the pastor came to visit him. And he said, Pastor, I, I don't know how to pray. It's hard for me. And the pastor said, just talk to him as a friend. No, but, but that's hard for me. I don't know how to do that. So the pastor got an idea and he took an empty chair and he put it next to the man's bed. And he said, you must imagine that Jesus is sitting on this chair and you can talk to him as a friend. And this is what the man did every day. He imagined that Jesus was sitting there on the chair and he talked to him. And then the one day the pastor came to visit him again. And he saw that the man was lying very quietly. And as he came closer, he saw that the man wasn't breathing anymore. But something that he would never forget is the man's hand was on the chair. He died holding the hand of Christ. Friends, you can hold the hand of Jesus tonight. He wants to be your best friend. Number four, Christ ascended to the Father. You know, friends, all the earthly politicians die. Nebuchadnezzar is dead. Alexander the Great is dead. Caesar is dead. Napoleon is dead. Hitler is dead. Mussolini is dead. Buddha is dead. Confucius is dead. But Jesus is alive. He ascended into heaven. And is interceding before the throne of God for us at this moment. You know, he has never lost a case. He is the best advocate in the universe. If you need an advocate, I can recommend him. He has never lost a case. If you surrender your all to him, you are a winner. You will win because of his merits. And the question that many people are asking tonight is, how can I find peace? How can I find peace? The everlasting gospel is the answer. He died, he resurrected, he ascended, and is interceding. That is the good news of the word of God. That is the good news of the book of Revelation. That is the good news of the three angels' message that's coming to God's people living in the last days. He's calling his people to be ready for his coming. Yes, friends, this message is not only for certain genders or races or age groups. It's for everyone, everyone living on the planet, from the north to the south, the east to the west. It does not matter where you are. This message is for you. And in this message, long neglected truths will be restored. Many people have... have through the dark ages, 
and through traditions of men have lost sight of some life-changing truths embedded in the gospel. There's a lot of emphasis on grace, but it becomes cheap grace because people are not allowing that grace to transform their lives into obedient followers of Christ. Yes, friends, these angels are bringing the everlasting gospel, the true gospel, the life-changing gospel to a dying planet. Revelation's urgent end-time message. Number one, it is calling us to obey God. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. What does it mean to fear God? To fear God means to respect or reverence God by obeying Him. It's not uh, that we're scared of God. No, but we, we look up to Him. We reverence Him. We respect Him. And we obey Him. That's what it means to fear God. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Proverbs 3, verse 1. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commandments. Yes, friends, we are saved by the blood of the Lamb. We are saved by grace. But God's grace is powerful. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. The man who wrote that hymn, who can tell me the name? John Newton, he was a wicked man, a slave trader. He did vile things, but the grace of God transformed him into a hymn writer, what do you say? That's the power of God. Revelation 14 verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus this is a description of God's end time people, His last day people, those who are prepared for His coming. The book of Revelation is no mystery. It is clear. It is understandable. Revelation 14 verse 7. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. So the next point is we need to glorify God. Firstly, we obey God, and then we glorify God. What does it mean to give glory to God? This is a very important question. To give glory to God means to praise Him in our lifestyle. Yes, friends, when we are saved by the blood of Christ, our lives are changed. We eat differently. We drink differently and we live differently first corinthians ten thirty one. therefore whether you eat or drink or whatever you do do all to the glory of god that's what it means to give glory to him romans 12 verse 1 i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of god that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Our bodies are temples. They're not fun houses. It's a temple where the Holy Spirit wants to dwell. Yes, friends, when we are saved by grace, 
we are transformed into commandment keeping people not just the commandments that suit us but all ten Paul says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me I can testify of the saving transforming life-changing grace of God you know Jesus doesn't just want to forgive us he doesn't just want to be our Savior he wants to be our Lord and King he wants to sit on the throne of your heart tonight yes friends through our lifestyle we glorify God Revelation 14 verse 7 and worship him who made heaven and earth the sea and springs of water who is this message calling us to worship it's calling us to worship the creator of heaven and earth friends we are living in a very wicked time where people are turning their backs on the creator where people are following man-made theories where our students our brilliant young people are being taught in universities that we come from monkeys our schools are being saturated with this teaching and in God's final hour in the last few seconds before we hit ground zero God is calling us to worship him who made heaven and earth calling us to true worship from the minutest atom to the grandest galaxy all nature calls us to worship our loving creator who formed us in his image and who wants to restore us into his image I've often wondered is it possible when people believe they come from a monkey they start acting like a monkey no wonder society is what it is today people are acting like animals the very basis of worship is the fact that God created us we did not make ourselves we were made and fashioned given life by a creator God a loving God Revelation 4 verse 11 you are worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created isn't that beautiful you are worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power because you are the creator you know friends the central theme in Revelation is worship we have to choose it's a choice that we have to make each one of us are we going to worship the Creator or are we going to worship the counterfeit the beast that's the choice that we have to make are we going to choose the seal of the living God his sign or the mark of the beast this is what every human being has to choose on the planet number three worship God so we need to obey God glorify God worship God the message of the first angel tells us what we are supposed to be doing it tells us why we are supposed to do it because God is the Creator we need to obey him we need to glorify him we need to worship him why because he is the Creator in Latin 
it says he created ex nihilo. What does that mean? It means he created from nothing. You know, when we create something, we take a few elements, don't we, and we create something. That was very creative. But we use something, isn't it? When God created, he created from nothing. Why is it so vitally important? Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. Take note, it doesn't say that the hour of His judgment will come. It says, has come. When this message went out, the judgment had already started. Could it be that we are living right now in the final moments of judgment hour where every person's destiny will be eternally decided upon these are awesome thoughts to think of the book of revelation is about eternal choices we need to choose now because tomorrow might be too late Revelation 22 verse 12. And behold, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. This is a very important text. When Christ comes, he is bringing the reward with him. What does that mean? It means that the decision has already been made. Who is saved and who is lost? Revelation 16 verse 7. Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. The God who can see the inner recesses of our hearts. Who can even read our motives is the one who judges. We can't fool him. He sees us inside out. Yes, an earthly judge can make a mistake. An earthly court can make a mistake. An earthly jury can make a mistake. But not the judge of the universe. He never makes a mistake. When Jesus comes, He comes with the outcome of the judgment. Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. That is the message of the first angel. Revelation 22.11 This is so clear, telling us that human destiny is sealed before Christ comes. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Jesus is calling to you and to me tonight to make an eternal decision. A decision that will impact eternity. He's pleading that we will surrender all. He's pleading that you will hand over your life to Him. And when we do that, we have nothing to fear. Because then, when God looks at my name, He sees Christ's record. But if I don't make a full surrender, my dirty rags, will condemn me. The angels are speeding around the planet. Messengers of hope, salvation, a new beginning. And that message is reaching us here in East London tonight. We can respond. It's a message 
It's a call to accept the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. You know, friends, we come as we are. Amen? But He doesn't leave us as we are. Amen? He changes us. If you think of someone, you know, who had an accident and the car is written off, and there's the panel beater, that car comes as it is, isn't it? But they don't leave it as it is. It's transformed. The message of the first angel is a call to the everlasting gospel. It's a call to loving obedience. It's a call to give glory to God in all our lives. A call to worship the Creator. An urgent call to live godly lives in the light of earth's final judgment. We're living in a very serious time, friends. There's a few grains left in the hourglass. What is your decision tonight? This urgent message of Revelation 14 reveals truth and exposes error. Revelation speaks of a system called Babylon, a system of confusion where people are misled and misguided to lose their place in the kingdom. Just like there was confusion at the Tower of Babel, this is religious confusion at its highest scale. Revelation 14 verse 8, And another angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. So this is the message of the second angel. Because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. False doctrines would come into the church through this false religious system called Babylon, where people have regarded the teachings and traditions of men above the Word of God. Yes, friends, we need to choose. Are we going to follow man or are we going to follow God? That's the choice that you and I must make tonight. The Word of God is our only hope. John 17, verse 17, Sanctify them by your truth. Your Word is truth. We cannot put the Bible aside and lean on human opinion. The Bible and the Bible alone. Yes, friends, these angels are bringing a message of truth to this dying planet. And you and I can choose tonight to accept the truth. And the truth will set you free. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Friends, we're going to have to make a choice with regard to the seal of God or the mark of the beast to follow Jesus the Savior or the counterfeit. A choice that each one of us needs to make. Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. That's the first angel. Now we're going to the third angel. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. You know, Jesus loves us so much that he has given this message into our hands. He doesn't want us to be deceived. He wants you and I to be saved. But He will not make the choice for us. We have to make the choice. 
a personal choice. And here is a beautiful summary of what God's people in the last days are like. Revelation 14 verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Jesus kept his father's commandments. And he's calling us to follow his example. Revelation 14 verse 7, worship the Creator. Revelation 14 verse 9, don't worship the beast. Revelation 14 verse 12, keep the commandments and the faith of Jesus. This is the message, the central theme coming to this planet. We need to choose. God's last day message warns us against the devil's deceptions in the last days. Many people are drunk with deception. The message of Revelation 14 is an appeal to surrender completely to Him and commit our lives to following His truth. Are you willing, friend, to surrender your all to the one who gave His all? Are you willing to give your life over to Him? Are you willing to allow Him to lead you from darkness into His marvelous light, from error into truth, from a life of sin into a life of victory. Are we willing to allow Jesus to take full control? A number of years ago, a little boy was very badly injured in a tragic car accident. They didn't have much hope for him. A long operation was performed. Very delicate surgery. The organs had been severely damaged. And as he was brought into the recovery room, the specialist said he needs a blood transfusion. And they started looking for a donor. Eventually, his father said that he would donate. But they needed a lot of blood. In those days, it was a direct transfusion from the donor to the recipient. So they connected the tube to the little boy who was unconscious and they put the needle into the father's arm and the blood, the red life-saving liquid started to flow. And the father looked at his helpless little child and tears were running down his cheeks. And he looked to the doctor. And he said, Doctor, if you need it all, you can take all my blood. When Jesus hung on the cross, he said, Father, take it all. Take every drop. I want to save my children. Are you willing to surrender your life to give your all to the one who gave his all. 